Hello. Welcome to Why Not Both. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I'm a musician and therapist in Los Angeles. Why Not Both is all about how our multiple passions inform our identity. And this season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine and produced by Laura Studeris. If you like what you hear, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and come spend time with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, and that is both on Instagram and on Twitter. We have a special double episode this week. We got to chat with Sadie from Sad 13 and Helena from the band Lustra. And both of them are not only brilliant artists, but also really fascinating wordsmiths. So we got to chat with both of them about how language influences not only our art, but our perceptions of ourselves. I hope that you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to Why Not Both. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've gotten our off the record Sandra Larky stories out of the way. <laughs> and no one will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Maybe you- I'll tell him mine someday. Maybe there's some like amount of pride in being the the secondhand CD that someone buys <laughs> the morning after they've lost their virginity in college. <laughs> I mean, I remember spinning his record so much like in college. That that was when I was listening to him too. He came into our college radio station and I had like a meltdown over how great he was. And everyone else was like, oh, he's good. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Yeah, he's really good. <laughs> this is going to be a good reminder to 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 revisit. It's been a while. His catalog. It's a great catalog. He just put out a new record. It's really good. There you go. I, this yeah. is my, today's listening. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's called Patience of all things. Um which I'm like, that's uh, that's appropriate because I was I was gonna ask like normally I, I in the before times I would ask people like, what is it that you do and what's a better question to ask? But now I think I'm just at what's a better question to ask because none of us know what we do anymore. Oh God, that that puts so much pressure. <laughs> Every question to ask is like, <laughs> how can I ever avoid making choices? <laughs> uh, it's funny, like I love. Um, well, I guess this kind of segues into the, the, the subject and theme of this podcast. Um, but prior to playing music as my job, I was a music critic very briefly. Um, my goodness. And then I was basically unable to get any editorial job. And this is 2011, so it's <laughs> a better climate then than it is now. Um, a lot of my friends who had been giving me work before were getting laid off. So I just on a whim applied to an MF, MFA programs that were funded because oh, wow. I was like, I can't seem to get any kind of editorial day job and freelancing is making me miserable. Let's see if I can get paid to go to grad school. And, and I did. Um, and sort of in the middle of all that, uh, you know, I've been in band since I was 14, but only when I had a job at a university and like a career track that was different did my band suddenly become popular (laughs) at all um I did I did manage to finish my degree but I wound up doing the final classes as like um independent studies basically Mm -hmm. from tour vans in oh my god um and sort of simultaneous to that as my band became popular suddenly people wanted to offer me work doing music criticism uh, which <laughs> just became weirder and weirder because I would, for example, write like a mostly positive but semi-critical review of a band and then meet them at a festival two weeks later. And, <laughs> you know, kind of awkward. <laughs> it just all felt like a huge conflict of interest. So in um, so I basically stopped doing any any stuff like that. But in quarantine, I keep getting offered bio writing work Um, I feel like for an ex-music critic musician, that is the most perfect writing gig you could ask for because you just get to ask people questions about their work and help them figure out how to put it in context. And they might not see the story in the piece of art they've created, but as someone outside who also does that work, it's easier for you to see the patterns. So I really love interviewing musicians and coming up with questions to ask them for things like this, whether it's a bio or um, just an in-conversation thing. But when you ask me, like, what questions should you ask me? 
I'm like, it's so easy to do to other people. And yet <laughs> <laughs> for myself, like, I've got nothing. <laughs> I mean, that I, it's an unfair position because like I'm in the position of the interviewer right now. And so I agree. Like if I were asked that question, I'd be like, but there's a myriad of questions. Why are you putting me on the spot like that? Yes. <laughs> Be like, but but I'm the question asker. Why? The question is, why can't I handle the pressure of attention on myself? Exactly, exactly. And what does that say about me and my issue with control? Is I this now know. telehealth therapy? <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert, uh, that's actually my day job. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad I don't have to pay you $200 for this podcast, unlike my real therapist. <laughs> but it's so funny. It's interesting when you're talking about the dynamism between like music criticism versus bio writing, because in a way, it's like you're asking the same things, but it's a different framework. <laughs> So I see water keeps coming up in these lyrics. Why do you think that? Say more. Exactly. Tell tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in bio writing, it is really hard to see your own story from the inside because you're living your story. And so you don't have the perspective of someone outside being like, oh, let me connect the dots for you because you're you're in your story. And so Yeah. And I think for for me, having come from that writing and editing background. It, I think a lot of times when, you know, when you hire a bio writer for an album, a lot of it is kind of inventing a story because when people set out to write a record, they're not, they don't have like three themes in their mind throughout the writing of all of it. A lot of it's sort of connecting the dots at the end and, you know, maybe overselling a framework that wasn't necessarily there. <laughs> maybe, you know, on a subconscious level, but but people don't often sit down to write with a mood board in front of them. Right. Um, right. At least not records. So I think that my background in doing that has made me a little bit better at saying like, oh yeah, the themes of this record are such and such. Uh, and I'm kind of thankful for having had that background because I feel like it's made it easier for me to do interviews and things like that. I see friends who really just got into music to you know play shows with their friends, which is the same for me, but they didn't have experience with like other corners of the music industry so right. once people put attention on them it becomes kind of like me when you were asking is there a question <laughs> I should ask you they just don't really know how to respond um, and I feel like I'm thankful I got to see some other corners before before music was my my day job and it's also fascinating that once you kind of it's it reminded me of that whole thing of like, don't think of a polar bear. Um, where then, what is that? Where, where when you want someone to think of something, you tell them don't think of it because if you ha you have to think about the thing to think about the antithesis. Well, it's thing. working now. I can't stop imagining a polar bear. Right, and that's yeah. like when, when you were like, all right, I'm going to get paid to get an MFA. That's when music was like, hey, what's up? Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, um, now you want me to play Mercury Lounge? <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> They're like, really? Really? And it's it's this weird thing of like, so much of, you know, the advice in the music business is like strategy and this, that, and the other thing. But I, sometimes it's just like, it's it's pure, dumb, weird luck that you just have to have something that's ready and there. Like you'd been playing in bands since you were 14. Like the music was there. Um, but it's almost like you had to turn away from it for a second. And then it was just like, hi. Yeah, as soon as people thought I was from not the state I was from, it became so much easier. <laughs> what state did they assume you were from? Well, I grew up in New York, and I um, I grew up in New York, then moved a couple other places as like a teenager, mm -hmm. and moved back when I was 20, uh, and was playing in bands kind of that whole time. And when I went for my MFA program, it was in Massachusetts. And when mm -hmm. I went up there is when I started doing stuff under the name Speedy Ortiz. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I cannot escape people saying that I'm from Massachusetts, even though I put in some years there, but not that many years. And I'm certainly not from there. Um, so funny. But as like a, you know, someone who'd just been in New York forever and playing around New York, I got offered a lot more shows at better venues in New York once I was not a New York band. What? <laughs> <It's> so weird. <laughs> That's why when people tell me they want to move to... 
New York or LA or a big city to make their band happen. Kind of like you might be better off working in a smaller scene. Yeah, that's wow. I'd never thought of that because yeah, I'm I'm an LA native, and sometimes playing shows here, everyone's like, "Oh, so you're an LA band?" Though I guess because well, I mean, no one's playing shows now, but it's like I am frankly more of a studio writer. Like I, mm. I prefer to hole up and play with synthesizers and hide like a weird mole. That's uh, what I wish I was doing all the time. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's that's like my favorite thing to do. I'm like, ah, I'm wearing a hoodie and playing a moog. Goodbye. Oh. Um, <laughs> <but> like, <laughs> your, your life is like my moon sign. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, stuck touring, I but I just want to play the, the Moogs. I just want to play the Moogs. Yeah, like a few people have asked me, they're like, oh, where are you from? And like when I say I'm from LA, they're surprised um, because I guess being from LA, people already have assumptions about what you're going to be like. Um, but I had never thought about it that way. I'm like, huh, maybe I should have a backstory about not being a Valley girl from LA. Well, I think it's it's honestly similar from New York where people – when you live there, just assume you aren't from there and are a transplant. So I think a lot of the assumptions people have about maybe not New Yorkers in general, but at least like New York bands are people who aren't from New York. And I think kind of same deal with LA, the, the, the stereotype of the Angelino is like someone who moved there from a different state and got really into like $50 yoga, (laughs) (laughs) which is not how any of my friends who are actually from LA are. But <laughs> no, no, it is really, it is interesting career. <laughs> yeah. And like being from a transplant city, that's a good way to put it of like that people just assume that you came there for a reason. And I I think that, you know, it's not unreasonable for them to assume that. Yeah. I got to live in a small town and have a whole house to myself for the amount I used to pay for a bedroom that that only fit my bed um, in the city I grew up in. So it's not really a place I could live anymore. But I'm happy. I, I live in Philly now and have for the past five years. Um, so it's only like a two hour drive for me to to visit New York. And right. yeah, it's not too bad. It's interesting because the cities really do, they foster, like you said, like, you know, sometimes it's better off to be in a smaller scene. And that's interesting that you saw people's perception of you change when they thought that you were from a smaller scene. And you're like, wait, hold up, what? No, the <laughs> like, Western Mass Band is <laughs> so different <laughs> from the local band. That's, and to now be writing about artist identities uh, as your job right now, I'm like, oh, wow, that's that's a whole turnabout. Like, What's it like helping people find that? Like, do you find that when you do write people's stories that they embrace them? Like, did the artist seem to change at all when you do write their bio with them? Um, sometimes you have those moments where people are just really psyched. You have to really draw a lot out of them to try to put together the narrative. And then when you do, they're just so thankful that someone else put it into words because contextualizing themselves is clearly, clearly not their strong suit, which mm-hmm. is why they, they hire someone to do it. Um, so that can be really gratifying, but it's also, it's just as fun to work with people who have a really clear vision of what they want communicated in their bio. And that, that makes my job easy. If they can write up the top, tell me, here's how I grew up. Like, here's what my goals are as a result of growing up in that way and draw some parallels between that and the songs. Um, that kind of hand holding is obviously fun too, because I don't have to, you know, pitch a narrative of someone's life to them. <laughs> I just imagine being like, this is your life. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes when I come to people like, hey, here are the, the themes of the album. Is it fair to extrapolate that you meant this from that? It's always like a little nerve wracking and they might tell me like, <laughs> no, that's completely wrong. But, like, you missed it. <laughs> Try again. Yeah, and that kind of, it's interesting thinking about artist bios in general because thinking about right now since everything is online, it's like, Oh God, that Eminem lyric just popped in my head. I'm like, you only get one shot. No, you don't. You actually get a lot of shots because we see things repeatedly online. Um, (laughs) But it's like to make a cohesive impression so that people know who you are because there's so many people online right now that it's like, if you can't grasp kind of at least a kernel, that you're like, oh, I see who this artist is. I see why I might resonate with them. I want to listen to them. Like, it's so hard to get that across sometimes because you're like, oh, who is this person? And all you have to go off of sometimes is like an image or two or like an Insta caption or things like that. 
Yeah. And when you're totally new, you you might not be looking at other people's careers in the way where you're cognizant of how to put that together for yourself. Um, yeah. And I think that especially when you're a brand new artist, that first impression, you, you better hope it's accurate because you're just going to get stuck being asked about it 10 years down the line, um, <laughs> yep. says this New Yorker who this week got asked about growing up in Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> love that I'm just like so how was it no (laughs) would have loved it would have been very idyllic your your made-up childhood was you know perfect (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness I was also thinking about when all of a sudden you said that then your music did like take off like what was that like self-concept wise that you'd been like okay I'm gonna do this MFA and then it was like JK you're in a tour bus now um <laughs> a tour bus please you're like I'm a, a tour terrible van, van. <laughs> <laughs> tour uh, van. Tour. and for a long time it was a minivan with you know drums in my lap um that is the way what was that like uh I mean obviously gratifying in in a, a lot of ways um and something that was kind of funny about it being the Speedy Ortiz project that the, was the one people cared about I'd spent the previous five years in a band, um, someone I was, I had been dating and the band kind of broke up when we did, Mm -hmm. but it was, I was still the primary songwriter, but he was really doing the production. He was playing, we probably split the instruments between the two of us, but it was just much more collaborative than Mm -hmm. the early Speedy stuff, which I home recorded. I played every instrument on, um, it was just really all me. So for <laughs> that to be the project that suddenly people were psyched on, there was certainly a little bit of, of cockiness with that. Like, <laughs> oh, that shows you. We spent five years building this and here are my home recorded demos made on a laptop mic and I was able to get the gigs we couldn't get. <laughs> but I, think, um, I think part of that is just, I mean, I'm sure you see this too. When it's so much easier to get an artist's first album covered than it is an artist's like sixth album. Um, I think yeah. people have a real fetish for what's new, which I understand too. I'm always like to discover new artists. Um, I'm also very loyal to the artists I've been listening to forever. Yes. But um, I think that was a, a big reason that it suddenly became easy. I'd spent five years, you know, building up to a certain level with one band and then there was something new and, the old opportunities were still there, but but also the ones of people who are excited about the new thing. So um, I don't know. I, I, I view in the same way you said earlier, like it's a matter of just continuing to do the work and sometimes you get lucky. I think that's a, a big part of how I felt about any career I've had in music. And so it's always been probably to my detriment, more important to me to make music I'm really psyched about than to really mm-hmm. overthink how people will perceive it or what I think I can do with it um, beyond just making myself happy. Like certainly I think a lot about the music business and uh, I'm interested in all of that and I'm happy to do all of the the business type work. But in terms of just like writing and recording the music, it's like me in a sweatshirt playing with synths. I just want to make something that makes me really happy at the end of the day because I know it's a crapshoot. And if I tried to make something to please people, it could go either way. So I'd rather just make something that pleases myself. And even if it goes either way, uh, I still know I made myself happy. That's, yeah. And that's, it's interesting to me that you said that that was to your detriment. I was like, uh, that sounds like an awesome way to make music. <laughs> I mean, I'm always going to make music that, that that I care about, but it's hard for me to, I look at stuff that gets popular and I think like, I guess I could try doing that, but it's not really the kind of thing I like doing. I'd rather leave that to, you know the people who do like doing that kind of thing and yeah maybe the stuff I like gets in vogue again someday. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, reading that article that enraged everybody for good reason about uh, the Spotify CEO saying that like artists have to, you know, churn out music more quickly. Yeah. Um, I was like, is that the right use of modifier there quickly? I was like, quickly or no, that's not a word, fam. <laughs> <laughs> I understood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, technically, if that's what he's going for, you could just have AI making that kind of wallpaper music that becomes... Well, that's exactly what Spotify Spotify is. Yeah. 
And it's like, but that's like a totally different genre. That That's almost like its own thing of like popular streaming music as opposed to like music that you're going to intentionally seek out and maybe like listen to with intent. Like I even think like some music is, uh, like popular music is music that I would listen to with intent. Like I was really excited to listen to Cardi B's new song. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was so stoked on that. And I really liked the somehow weird crossover of that hallway with like my favorite hallway scenes from Twin Peaks. I was like, how did that happen? Don't know. Um, but like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's an interesting cultural trope to be in a certain hallway. Hallways are scary. Yes. I was just like, Dining? Yes. I was like, maybe we're tapping into something about liminal spaces, and maybe that's analogized in what they're talking about in the song. But yeah, I listened to that song, and the thing is, I would never write that song, but I love that song. And I'm like, that's not something I would make, but I love it. (laughs) And there's plenty of stuff that, that is popular right now that I love or respect or I'm just fascinated by, but I know it's not the kind of thing that I like to write. And that if I tried to write it, maybe some different opportunities would open up for me, but I just don't have, I am, I'm so stubborn at only wanting to work on things that make me really psyched. Right. Um, so it, maybe that closes off some, you know, career avenues, but it's okay. Well, and also knowing like, knowing kind of like what's for you and what's not. I was talking to an artist yesterday about the difference between like writing songs for yourself versus writing for someone else. And that it was almost easier in a way um, that she was talking about to write for someone else because then she could imagine that she was that character, like who Mm. she sees that person as. Um, And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a really interesting writing exercise. And it's, it kind of reminded me of like the whole like Beyonce, Sasha Fierce. What was it? Beyonce? Yeah. Sasha Fierce? Oh, yeah. Sasha uh, Fierce. Yeah. yeah. And it's like kind of like almost like making yourself a character or writing for a character that's another person. Something different would come out than if you're writing just as something that necessarily maybe you would want to hear. And I was yeah. like, oh. Huh. It's funny. I'm trying to to wrestle with some of that right now because as I've been at home, there have been a couple projects that have come up where someone's asked me to produce for them remotely, where basically they just send me the song and I'm building out the track from home. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm such a bad, I'm a a bad collaborator, I think. (laughs) I just like to go into my little hole and, you know, spend a million hours in the DAW on the one track and then emerge once once I've made myself pleased that... um, I haven't really had to do much writing with other people, but when people are presenting me their songs, I'm just going into such, I'm going into the same deep production rabbit holes I do on my own track. And then so scared that we'll have to change anything because I become so married to my own vision. So thankfully everything I've done so far has been like, people have been into it and (laughs) I haven't had to deal with like negotiating a collaboration, but um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to learn to to do more back and forth, I think. <laughs> well, and one, it sounds like they're reaching out to you for production because they trust you. So, so maybe they know that I'm this horrible yeah. guy. Yeah, they probably are just like, you're going to take this, you're going to squirrel away with it, and when it comes back to me, I'm going to like what you did. That's why I gave it to you. <laughs> Crossing my fingers. But yes. yeah, I think huh. writing writing for other people... Because this is just production stuff. Uh, I haven't written for other songwriters before, but maybe maybe that will help me get out of the the preciousness of like every single synth part must stay intact must or else the song is compromised. With production work, like I just started producing one of my friends this year, and I had to kind of like uh, really get myself in the mindset of not being precious about my work because I knew that like ultimately it's it's his song yeah. and like if there was something he wasn't into we could change it and that was okay because like I, I would have these initial moments he's like oh can we change up the beat in this part and like internally I'd be like no but it's externally, perfect <laughs> yeah exactly externally I was like sure <laughs> so let's just say hypothetically in this situation let's change up the beat, but the beat you made is perfect. Do you like just save it for another project? I mean, I do sometimes save cause like, I don't, what dog do you work in? Cause I work in Ableton and it's very easy to just like move, move things from one project to the other. So if like, if something is scrapped from one song, sometimes I'll just like fly it into a different session. I'm in logic and it's not like stupidly easy to do that, but it's, it's doable. Gotcha. You can just duplicate the session and save the 
you know. Oh, you. gotcha. It's so funny because, like, I feel like there's like this weird truce between like Ableton logic and then Pro Tools users of just being yeah. like, well, I guess we can work together. <laughs> I wind <laughs> up having to use all three, I guess, uh, for SAD 13 because I make everything in logic um, and I do most of the, mo- on the first album, I just did it all at home uh, and then mixed with a friend. And then this record, I just did a tremendous amount of pre-production at home. Mm. Um, and then I sent all the multi-tracks to the studios that I wound up finishing in. So we basically mm-hmm. were going apart, like, are we reamping this? Are we retracking it with a much more expensive synth than I have at home? Um, but it's in, that's all in Pro Tools. And then when I do the stuff live, I create new stems f- f- to be backing tracks that I mm-hmm. play in Ableton and use an Ableton controller for. So I really wind up having to put this stuff across all the DAWs. Oh my God. Uh, which is silly, but um, <laughs> I guess they all have their strengths and I'm trying to use each for, for those. Yeah, because re-recording all those stems for a live, so that's really interesting because then you have more control over what you're playing in your backing tracks, but also it's not like you're just playing the track that you recorded for the album and like, that's it. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes I re-record. I tend to just remix, mm-hmm. um, but it's like I don't, I'm not going to want every single layer in the live performance or maybe not every single night. Um, just being able to have the flexibility to take things in and out or adjust them yeah. for the room or, you know, maybe the synth lead on the song is something I'm now playing on guitar. So let's mm-hmm. keep that out of the track. Uh, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. I was like, that's fun. Um, able to it's, it's so much work though. And I'm kind of, it's like my one relief in the pandemic is that I haven't had to, uh, remix the backing tracks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel you. The two, like the first two things I canceled, I was going to AWP, the, um, books conference mm-hmm. and then South by Southwest right after it. So I had a oh, bunch wow. of readings and then a bunch of shows and these were both like first two weeks of March. Um, oh. And I canceled both earlier than I canceled some my South by dates before I, anybody else I knew had canceled any tour dates out of just like an abundance of, at the time I thought paranoia, um, <laughs> although apparently just like totally sound logic that other people should have been done on a earlier way. too. Right. Um, but I had, yeah, I had plans to tour through March, May, June, July, you know, September. Um, and I just feel like I don't even know how to do it anymore. And it's only been a few months. <laughs> I've never been off the road this long. And even just like I, I was, uh, before we were taping today, um, I have been avoiding live streams because I think probably similar to you, like I, I do shows, but I production and like studio stuff is really what I like to do in music. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a struggle for me to figure out how to do things live. Um, especially on a record where I played pretty much everything myself and yeah. the arrangements feel like the songs to me. So I don't have a way to just sit with a guitar and play it and have it feel like it's the actual song. So I'm yeah. sitting here trying to figure out how to, you know, finger pick different synth parts that are a weird rhythm to the vocals and have it sound cohesive enough on just those two, you know, guitar and voice. Uh, and it's, it's a real head scratcher for me. <laughs> well, and also to be purposeful with what you're live streaming. Like I know that at the beginning of this, everyone was just like, welcome to my IG live. And like, now I'm going to start a Twitch channel. And I'm just like, yeah. I do watch some of them. And especially if someone like has started one for a reason, like I interviewed a uh, Hana, who she she's oh my god like love her so much she was such a delight and like watching the way that even like it was prior to all of this that she crafted her album on twitch like so she was showing people like how you produce an album live and that to me was like that's cool you're using this for a reason like there's a there's a reason behind why you're live streaming this as opposed to just being like yep it's me. (laughs) And so I like what you said that you were like, I'm figuring out a way to make it like meaningful to make the songs actually feel like the songs. Cause otherwise like, it's like, why are you, know, why are you doing that? And I think that it was a reaction to like all of us suddenly being isolated that people were like, I'm going to hop on live. Um, Yeah. And I think, you know, playing to tracks when it's a three piece band 
and the tracks are able to fluctuate depending on the space of the venue. Yeah. It feels different than me alone at home playing to tracks that won't change and my environment won't change. You know, there's something about being able to make the tracks respond to the environment that, that yeah. makes them feel like a part of the live show. Whereas at home to just play to them, it just feels like karaoke, which is its own thing. And that's fine. It's just not, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling to figure out a way to make it cool, which is why I've mostly been avoiding doing live streams, but I got one that's like, um, I'm just getting, I'm getting some, some fancy microphones out of it and I can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely can't say no to fancy mics and core. Nope. I, I definitely <laughs> got a pair of piano mics finally for myself because I'm just like, well, normally I'd rent them or have someone else mic my piano, but now I'm like, it's only me. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> we gotta take our get our kicks where we can. Exactly. I'm just like, haha! I will finally learn how to mic my own piano. The time has come. <laughs> 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 and what you said about it being like, you know, kind of like karaoke, that's, I relate to that feeling very much because it's different. Like I, I too, when I'm playing live, I'm usually playing synth and singing and playing my own backing tracks, but you're tuning into the energy of the people that you're mm -hmm. with. You can change the tracks while you're doing it. And also there's like the lighting and the ambiance and like the energy of the audience. And it's like all of that, whereas, you know, just being alone even though obviously like you know that people are watching your stream unless you're like looking at the comments which you don't want to do while you're performing yep <laughs> um like you don't want to be like oh hey adrian like you know <laughs> like <laughs> great to see you in the stream um like it, it doesn't it doesn't translate <laughs> in the <Yeah>. same way <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and so you're like uh oh, do i summon the energy to karaoke my own song this is weird you know, part of me is like, do I get back into Max MSP and make some kind of thing that's like responsive to mine? <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm so like overthinking it that I'm just not doing it at all. But it's time for me to figure it out, I guess. <laughs> well, you mentioned that you were doing readings, which pinged in my brain because when I when I Googled you, it came up that you are an American poet. I know. It's so funny. I, I love, love that. that. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but whoever did it, I love you. I was like, it sounds very much like, you know, just like a lyric, just like, yes, America. It's not wrong. <laughs> America. I have a poetry book, so let's put that up front. Sure. There you go. There you go. I'm like, tell me more about that, because that's rad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, ha I had a book out in 2018 called Mouthguard. Um, it was pretty darn close to the, the manuscript I turned in as my thesis for the, the MFA I was telling you about mm -hmm. so long ago at the time. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, as I kind of told you, I uh, was in an MFA program. And of course, as soon as I had something else to be working on is when people cared about my band. And mm -hmm. I felt kind of not pulled away from my, my MFA program because I was able to finish it. But while a lot of my friends, I, I just worked really hard doing two things um, for the, the three years that I was doing both. And mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't have any breathing room because I, between my commitments, teaching courses and showing up to classes and yeah. writing a thesis and doing the, the reading and the grading and also playing shows and touring all the time and basically oh, touring wow. any off days I had, um, I think I would have burnt out if I'd continued to pursue both to the degree that I kind of had to. Mm -hmm. So when, mm -hmm. I, when I got my degree, I had this book done and I just didn't want to think about it at all. And <laughs> while my other poet friends were publishing their first books or submitting to small journals and sort of building up their network of poets, I just like, I was like, I'm on, you know, I'm in Ghent. I am playing shows <laughs> with like weird European noise bands. I can't think about poetry. Um, so I didn't even bother sending out the manuscript until three years after it was done. And I don't know if you are like this, but I'm the same way with albums. Like right now I have an album done that's not out. I'm not writing any new music. I'm just waiting for this to come out so mm -hmm. I can feel like it's that chapter's closed and I can move on to whatever the next thing is. Um, and it's very similar for me with poetry. I had this book done and I just didn't want to be writing new work. So I, I yeah. barely was. Um, and I sent the book out to a friend who 
worked for, had a small press and then got hired at a different small press and she published it. And so I didn't even really go through like the normal process that a lot of my friends did of shopping their book and mm -hmm, knitting mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and I, I was able to do kind of a lot of touring on the book. Um, we sold out of the first pressing pretty quickly. Hey. Uh, my publisher then folded, so we haven't done a second pressing. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I was like, but, hey, that, ah. No, it's, it's okay. a roller coaster. <laughs> Unfortunately, very common tale. Um, but the exciting thing was once I had it done, I was like interested in working on a new book. So I spent the last couple of years writing one and uh, really just kind of finishing it up right before quarantine. And I have a second manuscript done now that I'm being much more proactive about than I was the first one. <laughs> I've just kind of started sending it around. So that's, that's fun. And you spoke to, you know, like you said that when you're pursuing two things that you would get burnt out if you were pursuing them both to the degree that you wanted to. And it's almost like, I find that when I'm talking to people who do two things or three things or more like the Spanish Inquisition of things, uh, <laughs> but it's almost like <laughs> things kind of have their season where it's like, yes. you know, that the other thing will be there. And like, almost like when you're done writing an album or writing a poetry collection it's almost like you want to do that honor of sending that into the world and being like okay that's done yeah uh, moving on to the next thing because I don't know if you have this feeling but if I start writing more be like almost like getting too ahead of myself I lose interest in the thing I haven't released and then yes. I'm like oh no 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 but this that's new why I won't so do much it more interesting I yeah I want to not care about the album that I have to promote <laughs> yes and then I'm just like oh, but this thing is so much better. And it, it goes back to what you're saying about novelty, where it's like, I'm almost obsessed with my own novelty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the new thing is always the most exciting thing. Exactly. I'm like, ah, that that gives me lots of dopamine in my brain. The other one's just like, a molecule. Why would I go for that one? Yep. <laughs> yep. Did that, this explains like 90% of my creative decision making. Yep. And yep. I read... Um, how do I, <laughs> Ooh, how do I use myself into what I'm about to say? Um, it's not even heavy. Uh, so I, I have been compared for a long time to David Berman. Um, mm -hmm. because we both went to the same MFA program and were in those programs after already like being musicians and music was sort of the thing that we were, uh, does that make sense? Like, obviously I'm not nowhere near as, um, influential or important as David Berman, but in the program, people would be like, oh, another David Berman. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> like as a, you know, sort of a teasing, joking thing because he was right. a musician who pursued that okay. specific um, MFA program at that university. And we studied with some of the same people. Oh, so, wow. Um, uh, when he, he passed last year, it was very sad for me as a huge fan of his. Yeah. Um, but I also wound up doing a tribute to him in Philly, uh, our World Cafe, the, the NPR program, um, mm -hmm. which is taped at WXPN, one of our stations, wanted to host a tribute to him. And they had Speedy Ortiz be the backing band for a number of local musicians, each doing like a song from throughout his career. So I wound up having to learn like a ton of his music just as the backing band. Um, and I also helped organize a poetry reading that was part of it of just like local poets. Mm -hmm. um, but I was reading a lot of interviews with him surrounding this too. And mm -hmm. he basically, he would get the question that I get all the time and like so, roll my eyes at somewhat because to me, the answer is so obvious as someone who does both. But people are always like, what's the difference between poems and songs? Like, how do you know what's going to be a poem and what's going to be a song? And his answer basically was what you said. Like, I'll go through phases where I'm only working on songs and then I'll go through phases where I'm only working on poetry. So whatever idea I have is going to go into whatever creative pursuit I'm working on at that time. I'm paraphrasing wildly, but that was <laughs> what he was basically saying, like, I don't do them at the same time. Right. And that's really true for me too. So when I was working on, I started working on this book around the time the last book was done and I was touring it. I did a lot of the tour via like Amtrak and bus. So I was really mm -hmm. those. Um, which is cool. You can't do that in bands, but uh, poets can Heck yeah. do all kinds of public transport. It's cool. <laughs> um, and then when I started working on this record, I wasn't writing the book at all. And once I was done mixing it, like literally probably the same day, um, I was interested in writing poems again. So it really does kind of pendulum swing back and forth between uh, whether I want to work on one or the other. What was 
And I t- I'm like, oh my God, I totally have a story to tell you, but I'm very curious. What was it like engaging with his work having been compared to him just by circumstance? I mean, I don't, I think that the comparison is really not, I don't think that my band sounds much like Silver Juice or Purple Mountains. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't think that our poems are really similar. I think it's mostly just that it's somewhat of a rarity for people to to work at, in both those levels, both those fields at like a pro level. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, getting to re-engage with, with all of it to such a close reading and listening degree, I did see a lot more similarities than I previously thought was there. I'm, I'm very influenced by his writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, one of the things that stuck out to me, you know, the songs that I think are, are very sad are, are quite funny. The songs that I think are really funny also have really devastating lines and that's yeah. sort of what he's famous for. And I think um, that that is, from his example is something that I was always really striving for not only in my poetry, um, which is a little bit less anecdotal than than some of his work, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's that's definitely something that I have tried to emulate. And revisiting all of it, I was kind of reminded what a what a looming influence he is for so many of us. Yeah, yeah, and even thinking about, I I did interview another artist who also has done an MFA program, though he focuses more on production and film composition. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, And he's on the East Coast too, uh, though not in Western Massachusetts. (laughs) I'm in Philly. (laughs) Um, I love that my West Coast brain is just like, you're all in the the, the little states that are funny shaped and they're all all in a schmoof together. We're off one highway. I feel the same way. Yeah. (laughs) Just like... People ask where I'm from. I'm just kind of like off of I-95. <laughs> different points of it, depending on the air. You know, yeah. And he he said something funny that he said that he didn't tell anyone in his program that he was a musician. Like he just didn't mention it at all because he almost wanted to have like kind of a separate identity as like now I'm a person in an MFA program. Well, because people will think you're a dabbler. Yeah. I was always very paranoid about that, of wanting to be taken serious as a poet when I'm also just like an idiot in a, you know, punk band. (laughs) I understand that impulse. (laughs) Yes. And that's, I mean, part of that is why I started the podcast is people's perceptions of people who do multiple things is like, uh, like, why do people discount if you do more than one thing? Like, why are they like, oh, well, you're just a hobbyist or this, that, and the other thing. And also, why is it bad to be a hobbyist? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I I think maybe because some of these artistic paths are so, there's so much emphasis on craft that um, it's hard to understand, to think that you could spend your 10,000 hours or whatever in multiple disciplines. I guess so. Because you do know, obviously that's not, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that was a weird turn of phrase in my head that I'm like yeah you have a finite amount of 10,000 hours <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah because there's very much like people will and I don't know if it's tied to commerce like that is something that I'm used about like last year especially prior to like everything that happened this year that I think has redefined people's identities a lot about like how we define ourselves by what makes us money too yeah, I think that that's true. Um, yeah, the, the the day job takes such a priority, even if it's not the thing we're passionate about or have dedicated the most amount of time to. Right. Or that there's like shame around liking your day job. Yeah, or shame around having a day job, which is um, obviously very sad since it's basically not sustainable to work in a lot of these fields without some other kind of income supplementing supplementing you. Yeah, you were talking about especially like living in New York that you're like, cool, cool. I basically have like a closet with a bed. <laughs> yeah, I definitely didn't consider myself like paralegal. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, and it's very... Uh, I think sometimes too, like, how do I even... There's there's sometimes like a gendered aspect to that. At least I mm-hmm. feel. I feel like a lot of my male peers you know, they'll get described as like a polymath. And often I read a review of myself and it's like Speedy Ortiz singer. And I'm like, what? I consider that like the last place thing I do. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. When you were talking about like, you know, producing your own work and collaborating with others and things like that, I don't know if you had this experience, but it took me so long to own that I was a producer, even though I was recording engineering and making all of my own songs. Yeah, I think that that's part of why I started doing the Sad 13 project, because even though I'd come from a background of home recording and was arranging and making all of the production choices, because I wasn't doing engineering on the records, I didn't want to credit myself as a producer. Um, Mm. So I felt like I had to kind of cram some of that knowledge and and catch up a bit before I felt comfortable giving myself that title. Even though plenty of my peers credit themselves as producers doing far less production work than I had been engaging in. It's such a, uh, I don't know, we have such a tenuous relationship with that title where people are really quick to claim it sometimes. And then other people who are very clearly doing that work um, feel uncomfortable applying it to themselves. Yeah, and and definitely, like you said, the gender description of polymath versus singer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like, we're like, yeah, I I did technically sing. I I also did a lot of other things. Question mark. <laughs> like, yeah, it's funny. This new record, um, I I I played almost everything. I programmed. I wrote all the drums, like programmed drums, and then got my very amazing live drummer Zoe Bratcher to play some of the parts I wrote um where drum machines wouldn't wouldn't fill it right uh I wrote for strings and woodwinds and got other people to play that because I can I've I've played cello on records before but it's like if there's like two notes and I can <laughs> auto tune that um but beyond that the only places I really got outside contributors were were for vocals because mm-hmm. I'm like I can play all this stuff or at least fake playing all this stuff but I can't really make my voice sound drastically different from myself. Right. Um, so it was really fun to get to bring in outside singers to provide those different timbres that I just can't produce with my my own voice. That's so cool too, to like, I haven't arranged as much for other people's uh, vocals, like unless I'm just writing for, for someone else to sing it. But I hadn't even thought of it that way of like, oh, there's different timbres of people's voices that of course you wouldn't be able to produce that because you live inside your body (laughs) and it makes it makes its own timbre. (laughs) Um, I look at bands like 100 Gex and I feel like they are able to do a lot of different kinds of voices just through digital manipulation. mm -hmm. But I think um, for wanting a natural sounding voice that doesn't sound anything like me. Yeah. uh, Didn't like Jason Molina do a lot of, of work like that where he would just have other people sing this sing songs. Am I, am yeah. I thinking of, yeah, I'd love to do a record like that. Yeah. And Oh God, now I'm like, my brain did a, I was just like, there's another artist that did that recently. And my brain is doing a blah. And I'm sure it'll come to me hours and hours later. Just paste it in. I won't even know. <laughs> oh yeah. That artist. That artist. <laughs> I love them. They're great. <laughs> Occasionally my brain will do that where I'll be like, I'll be like in session with a client and I'll remember something from a podcast interview or vice versa, or I'll be writing a song and remember something that a client said. And I'm just like, Oh God, the partitions in my brain are clearly very funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, you go back in time. Exactly. <sighs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I was, I was reading in regards to like the gendered view of people in music that more um, female and female presenting artists um, or female identifying artists have been posting photos of them like with their gear or them, you know, doing things other than singing, because for the most part, especially if you are singing on your project for whatever reason, people see female looking person singing that must be the only thing they do and it's a Mm -hmm. where did that perception come from (laughs) it's so funny some of the I've been doing um trying to get through music videos in quarantine which has been a fun and interesting challenge um the first one I just did alone with the director and it took a really long time because she was basically occupying every other part of the crew oh god Um, (laughs) and uh the second two I did uh directed remotely and I for both to varying degrees of success, had, like felt like I really had to explain, hey, I play everything on this record. We need to show me playing the instruments. Otherwise, I continue to get YouTube, YouTube comments that are like, who's playing guitar on this? Uh, I played everything, YouTuber. Like, <laughs> so I feel like I need to show that in 
I love to do narrative videos, but I'm also like, we're going to have to get some in there of me playing at least one to four instruments so that it's clear, you know, I just want it to be clear that there, there just aren't very many, you know, one person bands that are yeah. known for that other than the the men who are very famous for doing so. Even though like I know plenty of women and I know plenty of non-binary people who perform and record that way, we yeah. just aren't credited or thought of. Um, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I want to, I want to show it off as much as possible. Yeah. I remember reading an interview with, with Bjork where like she was yep. saying that she was just like, I'm so tired of having to explain that I produced my records. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that she's like, what will it take? And I feel like in some way, like Grimes is similar where it's like, she makes such a point of doing everything herself. Mm -hmm. um, talks about it a lot where like, you know, there's something in me that I'm just like, okay, I get it. Like you do it all. But I also get why she's saying repeat second. Like, she oh, doesn't me. say that. Yeah. 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 And so I'm like, it's, you know, it's kind of like, if she doesn't say it, that's when people will be like, oh, well, did you do the mix on that? And it's like, yes. <laughs> I think I read a thing where she started to work with an outside mix engineer and it was like a big moment for her because she is just so used to not receiving credit that to even work with outside collaborators just feels like relinquishing something, even though yeah. like collaboration is for a lot of people really essential. Well, and I find, I don't know if you find this, but I, you know, it's taken me a while to find people that I really trust with my mm -hmm. stuff, but that when I send my stuff to like the two people that I really like that do mixes, they hear my stuff differently than I'm going to hear my stuff because I'm too deep in my stuff, much yep. like the writing artist bios where like the artist is busy living their bio. So it's I like, really need that outside check. There might be some really annoying frequency that's happening the entire time. And I just have heard it so much that I'm immune to it. Exactly. I, I can't be my, so I mix my own stuff once in a while for like one-off projects, but on albums, I really rely on someone that I have a good working relationship with. And I also can't mix remotely. Um, I think because of that, that same thing of like, just needing to be hands on. And even if it's someone who I'm a great collaborator with, just being able to be in the room to say like, let's ease off on the depth of this one plugin. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You're just getting something without context. It's hard to know how to make the exact changes you want. What's really cool is now, I don't know if you've used this, uh, there's a site where you can basically stream the audio from yeah. one yeah. computer. I love that. I, was I did it with, once. Oh. I was working with my mixer and it was so cool because I could hear it on my monitors, but obviously like we can't be in the same room. And so it's like, and then like, and we were just on like FaceTime. Um, and so that way I knew what he was doing so that I could be like, Oh, do this, do that. Like, so that we could change it in real time instead of being like, Oh, I'm going to send you the file and then you can listen to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I love that. Um, they're only it's not I mean, like a full replacement for being in the room together, but it's certainly a big help. It was such a big help. Yeah. And it, obviously it's different than when you're in the same space together, but it was so much better than having to like send like final version, final, final version. Uh-huh. Yeah. Final really mean it this time. 5.7.1. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I think that that's like every musician's like not so secret secret that we all have mixes on our computer that are named like final master 10.2.z. Seriously. <laughs> And I can't I, delete things either, so they're all just living in a drop. Oh, yeah. Out. They're all hanging out there for reasons unknown. <laughs> what if I want to hear what the first pass of the master of this album from 2013 sounded like in, in another decade? Exactly. It's there. That's why we all have, I don't know if you have these, but I have like a ton of like external hard drives mm -hmm. and like iCloud yep. base. <laughs> yep. I, I pay for like every kind of cloud storage possible and they're all full. <laughs> yes. I feel like any non-musician listening would be like, why do they do that? And any musician's <laughs> like, I feel seen. Because I'm a hoarder, but it's for files. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I guess like in closing, what advice would you give to someone who is engaging in multiple things? Because it sounds like you've pivoted a lot over the last like few years and then certainly over quarantine times, I guess, yeah. <laughs> what would you want to know if you were a listener being like, how do I do all of the things? Um, I think my, my big advice and the thing that, that I think has been the biggest help to me is I've just 
been flexible um, and maybe like a, a pessimistic form of realism. Like I know that when opportunities come up, they might not be there forever. So I've tried mm -hmm. to pursue them as they come up. Um, and I think that's allowed me to do a lot of kinds of work or collaborations or interesting projects that, um, you know, if, if I was more conservative about my time, I might not have been able to get involved in. At the same time, the advice that I need to take for myself is uh, learning to say no sometimes, even mm. when the project seems exciting, because I certainly have a tendency to say yes to everything I'm excited about. And then it doesn't leave time for the projects I care the most about, like, mm. like making a record. Um, so I think working to find that balance for yourself of uh, how much are you comfortable saying yes to, like say yes, even when the project scares you a little bit, because that might wind up the most interesting thing. Um, but if it's something you've done a million times before and you feel overwhelmed by, you know, the possibilities of these new things, just just <laughs> being able to look at your calendar and, and be re realistic about your time so that you can get sleep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are really the two things I think about most when I look back on what I've done that I think was smart, which is to... Mm -hmm you know, say yes to new projects that might seem scary, but um, would help me try something different. And mm -hmm. then also when I'm like, oh, I should have said no to, you know, doing the millionth like radio performance. Right. Because um, I needed to sleep that day. And I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, what is sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty familiar with it now and it's going to be hard to go back. <laughs> yeah, I I would say that like, from just what you said, like learning that time is like kind of your most valuable resource and to, to use it judiciously to be like, Oh, like I'm going to use my time to go towards things that I'm afraid of because they're going to help me grow as opposed to use it towards just saying yes to everything that's momentarily exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I like that advice. I'm going to do my best to take that advice. <laughs> that would be too, honestly. <laughs> Where I'm like, exciting things? Yeah. <laughs> Sleep? What? <gasps> oh, well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Yeah, this was really fun. Welcome to Why Not Both. We've been talking for like 10 minutes about rad stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> no one will know what it's about. <laughs> Secret mm. podcast. <laughs> I'm so curious before in our secret podcast moments, we were talking about <laughs> video and how it had evolved. And I was like, tell me more because you just released that today. Yeah, that's true. Um, this single is called Tore. Um, the song has been out since uh, May 1st, but the video only came out uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I finished working uh, with it with the director, Tomek Pieniak. Um, only only a few days ago, and because we had a couple of mishaps. Uh, first of all, we had uh, an, an illness on the crew, and uh, this put a halt on the works, and we had to wait a little bit. And then, of course, the pandemics came, and uh, of course, it it took its toll as well. But here it is. Here is this <laughs> video, and I'm really glad how how it came. Um, across from this kind of, you know, um, very minimal concept of just me uh, being this robotic personality mm -hmm. in a studio uh, in neon lights and stuff into uh, like a full-on story of not one, but three different people <laughs> who, <laughs> who, who get like a kick in, uh, for doing stuff uh after watching me performing this this, this that. persona that i am in video and this is this is amazing i felt like it would never be possible but but yeah <laughs> here it but is it's possible it's here i was curious like usually I, before the pandemic i would ask people like what do you do and what's a better question to ask but i feel like during the pandemic it's it's just better to say like what is a better question to ask because we've all like restructured what it is we do oh yeah i don't know this has like 
fallen in line with so many changes in in Lustra as a project. I mean, mm -hmm. we came well. It it came from being a duo to being my solo project. So I mm -hmm. I'm spending the the lockdown and the well the not so much going out time <laughs> uh, into into um, learning my Ableton live and learning production and. I started working on my new material from mm -hmm. from the, from the very basics. I mean, it's really exciting. Ableton like is so much fun. It is. It is also kind of I don't know about your learning curve and <laughs> your approach <laughs> to things, but I'm like, are you more of an explorer, or would you rather have someone teach you um, stuff like Ableton? I'm, and I'm a mix. Like, have you taken any workshops on it online, or have you been doing it mostly on your own, or? I've done, I've done, I think I've done a single tutorial and <laughs> other, other thing is just clicking around and my yeah. husband is showing me around too. I think this is my, this is my best bet. Like I want someone to uh, give me a quick tour and then I can uh, play around with it. Yeah. Like that's, I think I'm, I'm similar to you in that if I want to know how to do something really specific, like I will look it up and I tend to, I'll keep the tutorial up on like my phone or my iPad and then like follow along on my computer mm -hmm. because otherwise I'll watch the tutorial and be like, oh, that makes total sense and not remember any of it. Anything. Yeah. You have to like <laughs> stop it bit by yes. bit and yes. try, try the stuff out and on your own machine. Yeah. Otherwise you get, you get so lost. Exactly. I'm a big nerd yeah. of music production. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I, w I wish I c could kind of absorb it without doing all this much learning, but I've been like that with everything. So. <laughs> it takes a long time. Like I have so much admiration for people that I've worked with um, because I definitely for a long time, and I don't know if you had this experience, I would watch them do it and it looked almost like sorcery where I was like, how does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a sorcery or something really, really effortless. I have the same impression when I'm, I don't know, watching ballet. It looks like yeah. they were um, doing this and they, it looks so natural. But it's just, you know, all the hard work behind the scenes that we don't know about and all the crunching in, in yeah. front of our computers, right? That people don't yeah. see. Yeah, that so it looks effortless at the end when really it's like, I. I don't know how many hours I've spent making stuff that, you know, obviously I don't think I'll release it. It's mainly just like stuff that yeah. I've worked on learning yeah. production on. <laughs> yeah, twitching, twitching with it. Yeah, no, it's a, like a long, long road ahead of me before I even like release anything I'm, <laughs> I'm trying out. <laughs> I just get like all tiny all plotting clips. hands. I'm like my yeah. friend. <laughs> it's like knitting, really. <laughs> yes, where the first thing you make, you're like, here is a lumpy scarf, but I made it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I got a couple of these up my wardrobe at the moment. Yes. <laughs> Next up, you're like a lumpy scarf, but with purling as opposed to knitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be that. Yeah, knitting is good for your patience. I should probably knit more. There we go. There we go. Oh no, I'm gosh. I'm knitting I'm knitting songs instead. Oh that made me happy. It was a your kid compared embroidery work to production work and I, I found that rather apt. Yeah, this is this is precisely it. Sometimes you're really like mad at what you what what happened that how you can't get somewhere yes. you want to be yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes you destroy your work because you're not happy with the result and but yep. then you start again and exactly <laughs> exactly the result is beautiful and exquisite yes yes have you been doing during all of this i know that you do a lot of translation work which fascinates me especially because in your email you said that you focus on song lyrics and i was wondering if you've been doing that during this time too uh yeah uh actually i uh, i write more lyrics than i use i uh sometimes i'm a lyricist for other people so mm -hmm. i've been i've been doing my my own lyrics work and also for for some other acts I don't do much song translation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
perhaps because Polish and English are so totally different in, in terms of composition, and I've devoted an entire master's thesis into uh, translations of uh, English songs into Polish, uh, done by people who are so way more renowned and way better than me. And they, the translation still didn't sound very natural and still didn't mm. sound very well. So I, I, I like, uh, I like, you know, looking at it and comparing it and seeing how, how the fabric of a song is different in, in each language and how, yeah. how the, the metaphors can't really, you know, get translated directly, but how the, the semantic dominant, as Barańczak called it, of a song is transmitted from one language to another. Uh, too bad so many of these songs were, I, I don't think any of these songs that I've analyzed have been recorded in Polish. It would be wonderful to just hear them. I've, I've yeah. spent a lot of time singing them out loud <laughs> myself <laughs> for oh, comparison you're... purposes. <laughs> yes, yes. That, but, uh, there are no official records. That's fascinating. Like, what initially inspired you to do that? Because language is so particular to culture. And like you said, that there are certain metaphors and images that really are so specific to that language. And I was like, oh, I'm curious what inspired you to do that. Mm. I think uh, I've always been in love with rock and roll. And rock and roll is so rooted in um, American and British culture. Mm -hmm. And I think what, and this is where where the music originated, right? It basically got imported mm -hmm. when uh, first Polish rock acts um, started writing music in like fifties and in the sixties. They could only like look up to their Western colleagues, mm -hmm. and there was really no benchmark. So it was like transferring a, a musical structure, which is very very. Uh, language specific mostly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, I found it extremely fascinating that this and also the lifestyle that came with the music I think the the, the young Poles in the 50s and 60s were uh, had absolutely like wild ideas of what the rock and roll people <laughs> looked like <laughs> and uh, I think that this is how the the ly lyric translation uh, started. These were people who were um, fans, uh, radio DJs who were just so engrossed in this music that they uh, wanted to uh, bring it out for a wider public because um, at the time, not so many people spoke English in Poland. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like the, it wasn't as, widely spread as it, it is now it was mm -hmm. like a, I think the language of diplomats and uh, a very select minority mm -hmm. so I think the how, how, how the lifestyle was perceived as vivid and um, English has so su such a particular structure you, pro you probably don't th think about it much as an it's native a, speaker it's a disaster <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say it about any any language that you speak. <laughs> well, like, we can say it mostly about the the one that you were born into, right? <laughs> yes, I, um, I really I admire people who learn English as a second language, and I do wish that in American culture we would learn other languages fluently. Like I did take. In school, I took French and I took Spanish, but none to the point of fluency. And then in college, oh. I studied ancient Greek and Latin. Obviously <gasps> not to the point of fluency, but still to the point of translation. Oh, oh great. <laughs> um, my skills are very rusty right now um, because needless oh, to say, yeah. it's not a great everyday skill unless you're a classicist. <laughs> but <laughs> True. You, you absolutely can't have a conversation. <laughs> even no, <with> the <laughs> no. I didn't graduate in English studies and this is what most students do. They, you know, they learn medieval English and, and stuff, but I, I can't curse at people in... <laughs> In the, that language, I can curse at them in Polish and we go. <laughs> English and French and Spanish and perhaps Welsh if I, if I dust it off a little bit. But, Ooh. 
that sounds like because I was like French has some really really great swears <laughs> oh yes <laughs> I yeah. love British swear words oh um, yes I think the Shakespearean swear words they're like the most descriptive and yes the longest <laughs> they're so they always they're so like pointed and crunchy whereas the French ones are mm. so just like they're almost like sly it's like I'm insulting you but in a really really funny way <laughs> but it, yeah but, it, but it's you're you almost feel like thanking me for this <laughs> it sounds so good <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, and when I was when I did study other languages, especially in translation, that is when I gained a lot of uh, both sympathy and empathy for people <laughs> translating into English because I was like, this language is like a mishmash of so many different things. We in some ways like steal structure from so many different languages, but like cobble True. it together. But like we conjugate things, but not really. We don't have declensions on things. Like it depends on weird <laughs> word order. Like it's just I'm like. Oh my God, trying to learn English would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, I don't know. Uh, English somehow came uh, naturally to me because I was like so, I don't know, uh, it was like all around me. My my parents both spoke English, which wasn't like very, um, like I said, it, it wasn't, in, it didn't happen in every household back then. Yeah. I was born in the eighties. My my dad is a massive fan of rock and roll and uh, <laughs> British music, especially. Like he loves the Beatles. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. the, like his absolutely top act of all time. And uh, he wanted to do English studies, but he he ended up studying something else. But he was also always fascinated by English, and mm -hmm. so. I've learned nursery rhymes when I was a kid and oh. uh, I don't know I've learned a lot of English from Cartoon Network for example because <laughs> back then in the 1990s it was only in English in Poland yeah yep. might come as interesting <laughs> well and especially when yeah. you'd learn like all sorts of like little American phrases too I would guess from different yeah countries. Yeah, from, from Dexter's Lab or uh, the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> oh my God. That kind of thing. I love the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that stayed with me. <laughs> That's, oh my gosh. And you said that your mom spoke English as well. Yeah, she did. Uh -huh. she, she speaks a couple of languages, also French and German. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, my, my, my parents both speak a couple of languages. So uh, I think that you know that that was my destiny to do the job that I do yes and I'm sure that people both lyrically and otherwise like language translation is fascinating to me because even when I was studying it it's so hard to get across the same feeling like it's almost like instead of translating word for word sometimes you have to like read the whole thing and then translate but yeah like when when I would translate I would generally read a few sentences at a time just to kind of get a feeling for things and then exactly especially in lyrical translation music or poetry yeah. poetry you have to you have to do this to, to to get this feeling to have this like idea of what the song is about and what the the person that speaks in the song wants to talk about and what is the message that they're trying to uh, come across with this is this is really hard especially with the different structures that the two languages have English has so many like one syllable words for example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they uh, you probably don't, don't 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 notice it because you're a natural but they come and great in songs they, they finish <laughs> off every every sentence every uh, every verse uh, in Polish, words are so long, <laughs> really. <laughs> it, words have different lengths, and this is mostly why uh, English song, English language songs uh, turn uh, out so clumsy in Polish. Because mm -hmm. I would guess that, like, like you're saying, there's too many, it's almost like there'd be too many syllables to fit into Too them. many syllables, true, yeah. Mm -hmm. If yep. you want to translate word for word, that's like basically impossible because the words are too long and right. you'll end up with like so many extra syllables and sh 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 that you don't know. Yeah, but you're do. like, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, there has to be something else. <laughs> oh, so it sounds like it's almost then in some ways is it easier to go from polish to english than english to polish when you're trying absolutely yeah it go it's 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 fairly easy and it's absolutely uh 
easier to write a song in English than it is in Polish. Wow. I, I don't know. Um, there are many, many bands elsewhere, everywhere speak, sing in English. Because I, I would bet that it's for this exact reason that uh, their language is less clumsy and uh, it's like more, more concrete. Uh, mm -hmm. Where the shorter messages come across more easily than with with, with such an oblique language in Polish <laughs> is. <laughs> and that's the very direct. reason. That, pardon? Yeah, it's very direct. This is exactly that. And it's a different reason than, I don't know, for example, Swedish or Icelandic bands singing in, in English. I think it's it's something else because it's pretty well generalizing it's the same family of languages as english mm -hmm. is but uh, in polish or apart from like not not so many people speaking the language uh outside of of poland um mm -hmm. i think the the length of the words and and this ease of you know making up words <laughs> <laughs> with the melody uh it's 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 why so many bands turn turn to english well, and I would imagine that attempting to express images that, um, I'm trying to think of even how to say it, it's like that you might have a linguistically in Polish culture, because like the, the language always reflects the culture. So it's like trying to express those images in English might be like kind of a fascinating challenge. Of course. Of course. Uh, but it helps a lot that many, uh, especially rock and pop songs talk about themes that are quite universal love heartbreak <laughs> yeah. what else is there not 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 much is there really <laughs> just in a cycle just love then heartbreak then love then heartbreak then love again yeah <laughs> i was thinking about a third thing to make a nice triad but i couldn't find it <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh are you okay i am there was a leaf blower outside about an hour <laughs> oh no everyone's like oh my god do you have the rona and i'm like no i just do i my body thinks that trees are a mortal threat <laughs> oh my gosh i've heard i've only learned about the word the rona yesterday from a guardian article <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> it was so amazing i don't think we came up with a nomenclature in uh -huh. in, in Polish yet. You, you English speaking people are so creative. <laughs> <laughs> There's been people said the Rona now, like people are referring to like staying inside as just the quar instead of like uh -huh. quarantine, the whole quarantine. thing. Like, oh, what are you what have you been up to during the quar or like what phase of the quar are you in? <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are I hadn't thought of that. Like we are really adept at coming up with very strange little shorthand words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is why why English is so good for songs. So another thing, <laughs> I don't know. It just it's just so e words come easy. <laughs> they do, and now that I think of it, like the meter in English, it's easier to fit English words into different meters, or at least mm -hmm. Romance languages, you can kind of massage them into different meters. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's mass massaging the words. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a wonderful concept. <laughs> Trying to gently nudge them towards a meter. <laughs> uh, uh huh. And they might fit in or not, but they mostly do. They mostly do. They're they're in there. <laughs> they're they're ge they're gentle. They cooperate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was thinking of like English and French, and mm -hmm. even I mean it was a bit tricky with. Uh, I would say in ancient Greek, like when I was translating that, like I was yeah. translating Homeric Greek, which is in dactylic hexameter, which is, it, it fits really well with Greek. <laughs> but I'm trying to imagine it like I did translate into English and it was, it was a bit of a challenge to get it in there, uh -huh. but it, you could still, you could still manage. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's also fascinating that different languages have different meters, but well, because they have, we have different words, right? Yeah. yeah. So, some some just don't work very well, and they don't sound very natural. Yeah, like what are some of the common rhythms in Polish language? 
oh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> not really prepared with this. Like, surprise, super nerdy yeah. question. <laughs> this is a very nerdy question. I have to, like, I, I have to uh, use some aids here because I haven't had a Polish lesson since... 2005, which That's is a long time ago. PowerPoint section of the podcast. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like in English, it, it can easily follow almost like a like a sing song rhythm, like da 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 da. Like those yeah. are very easy rhythms in English, but I would imagine that those like that it doesn't follow in because like what language system is is Polish related to? Well, we have. Um, is also the dactylic uh, meter. Mm -hmm. uh, the every third syllable is accentuated, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, apparently so. But what I remember from uh, poetry classes at school, uh, for example, that, for example, one of, of the most renowned Polish poems from uh, 19th century uh, mm -hmm. is written in like a 12th syllable meter. Oh, interesting. So again, this is like very uh, or thirteen syllable meter. So this is like really again long phrases. Yeah, because I was thinking it would be like da 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 da. Like that's but that's a very different feeling. Mm, yeah. Ooh. I like that. I'm. I'm <laughs> I like that you're going on this journey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm like, welcome to Why Not Both. We talk about dactyls. <laughs> <laughs> dactyls, like, yeah. Well, I was thinking about language systems in general, that languages evolve based on what's culturally important. And it sounds like longer thoughts are, and like more, not more expressive because, I mean, English is expressive in its directness. English is expressive and very direct at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it sounds like from how you're describing the Polish language, it's more like, it's more drawn out. Like, it sounds like it's almost mm -hmm. like a fuller image. True. Yeah. If you, if you look at translations, uh, like, side to side, you'll see that the Polish version of an English sentence is perhaps... Uh, three times as long or <laughs> twice as long it's still not as long as German for example with so many yeah. compound words I don't speak yeah. German so I can't like talk about it much but uh, yeah so we, we have lengthy formats and where I'm curious I'm always curious in foreign languages where does the verb fall in Polish sentences this is this is uh, tricky uh i think it's um somewhere about the middle of a sentence mm -hmm. or the first part of the sentence and so that's japanese for example when it, when it falls somewhere at the end and you have to yeah. wait uh, until the very end of the phrase to to actually know where uh what's going to be said i don't know how simultaneous <laughs> interpreters work in, in japanese because this sounds so this sounds so impossible to do yeah to like hold the whole especially doing live translation like uh, holding the whole sentence in your mind until you get to the end and then being like ah there we go true oh well, no, there's <laughs> something else <laughs> yep <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering because of that, like, because English, it can fall kind of in the middle of the sentence. You can even have sentences that are just a verb with an implied subject. Like, it's such a directive language that I find it interesting that even in, um, like, in the classical languages, the verb can kind of go anywhere um, because it's just based on the ending and the form of the verb, like, what, you know, what tense and what yeah. number and everything it's in. Um and I always found that fascinating that sometimes you get the verb like very soon in the sentence and sometimes you're translating in a few lines and you're like, where the heck is the verb? <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know why I'm so focused on verbs, but I'm like, yeah, like knowing it's that. Verbs and are important, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the compelling part sometimes to be like, where are we going with the sentence? True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Polish is also fusional. So I guess you... Uh, you can uh, like interchange the order of uh, the sentence pretty oh. much. For example, 
if you if you say like Mary loves John and John loves Mary, it would mm -hmm. mean something else. But in uh, in in Polish, like depending on the like inflected verb forms, it might mm -hmm. mean exactly the same thing. Oh wow! And we we don't know about the other person's feelings. We are still talking about this the same like subject. Oh, oh, that's fascinating. Right. <laughs> yeah, especially catching that kind of subtlety because, like you were saying, in song, like so much of its metaphor and image and things like that. But to catch like the inflection of a verb is really challenging because English doesn't have that subtlety. True. For example, English has tenses, Polish has fewer tenses. And mm -hmm. um, so there's like this, this part of, of grammar that the, the students skip. Uh, but we're very surprised when you start learning other yeah. languages and Polish that you guys have so many tenses. Oh my gosh. Well, in English, I'm so sorry having to learn all our tenses and then being like, that's the general guideline, but half of it's an exception. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and especially as especially so in French. Oh my gosh. I, would say. <laughs> I remember studying French in high school and just going, oh, this is a bit like English, where it's like, here's a rule that only like two of the words actually follow. <laughs> Everything else is <laughs> true. <laughs> I'm like off the map. Um yeah. And how do you find when you are working with other bands, like do most of the people you're working with also speak English as well that you're helping with lyrical translation or not, or? Uh, yeah, they, they do speak English and uh, they have like very advanced attempts to, to write their lyrics. And most of the time they're just minor corrections that need to be done. And it's mm -hmm. really helpful when, when, uh, the the people I work with uh, have this kind of openness and uh, kind of humility to 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 come to me and to open their work to to me to mm -hmm. to work with them to to make it even better to sound it to make it sound more like natural and more like actual English. Mm -hmm. Uh, because what bands often do is that they write in write in English, but uh, with you know, as with every like for for everyone for whom English is not the first language, it's it's not for me either. Uh, but I've been working with it for a long time, and I I think like many expressions and structures uh, mm -hmm. that bands employ in their songs are very. Polish, so mm -hmm. that the imagery is not 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 that universal and not that clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so other, another thing is that bands uh, want to sound more like native speakers, and I'm I'm trying to work on on their pronunciation. Oh, so that okay. the, the Polishness doesn't like ooze from, from <laughs> the words. <laughs> when, when you're speaking of, you know, sounding like a native speaker, but having different images, I would imagine that it, you might come up with, um, in a way, like more unique images if you're writing from another linguistic standpoint than English. True. Yeah. It's, it, it, be, it might be something very original, but it could be like so original that it becomes obscure and the listener just goes, what the hell? What What is it about? What, yeah. What <laughs> It's, it's, pretty, yeah. it's kind of like bad poetry, you know, when the, the metaphors are, are so unclear or so personal that the, the reader has no idea what uh, the, they're like, the what? poet has in mind, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's amazing when uh, gradually as you become more and more immersed in a foreign language as you're learning, you, you tend to like shorten and later almost cut out this translation process in your head right like, yeah. like right now I, I don't really like, think much about what to tell you but I'm sure this translation process goes on somewhere yes, <laughs> in the background, background. <laughs> this is amazing how, how the brain is wired yeah because we are open especially as as infants but at a certain point our brain kind of like uh, isn't as plastic in that area and so everything else does come through as translation um, and so it's like as close as you can get to a native language, but that's mm -hmm. why like when, when you said like make them sound like less Polish, like when they're singing, it's like, 
people, we lose the ability to sometimes learn different phonemes from different languages. Because um, our brain just so, goes, yeah. we're good. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and that's why it's so hard to learn like the accent in different languages and why people, like even when they really study the uh, the language, they can yeah. have accents. That's, that's true. Like I think this like spe specific, specifically uh, prominent in people who are trying to speak French. Yeah, they still sound like you know the background language. Their first, they still sound like their first language. Yes, yes. Well, of of course, like French people speaking our languages also sound French. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah, some some languages are just hard to hard, harder to mimic than than others. Yeah, like and some of the vowel sounds, I would imagine at least like English vowel sounds are pretty easy to sing because they're so spread out that like. True it's easier sometimes to sing in English because you can just kind of blah. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is, yeah. This, this is it. And all these, oh yeah, all the fillers, like yeah, and so on. <laughs> oh yeah, or ooh, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I try to do ooh in Polish, that sounds <laughs> so strange. We don't get, we don't have that in songs, really. Right. Or I think of even in Icelandic, like, yeah, there's like, yow. But like it ends, <laughs> and so you're not yow. yow at people. Like that's gonna, and mine is obviously very special. <laughs> Sorry to all my Icelandic friends that have to listen to me say yow. Um, because I'm like the valley girl being like yow. <laughs> but like, yeah, but it probably wasn't very Icelandic, Icelandic but it was no, no. very realistic. <laughs> but it has like an, in, in that one sound, it has like an A and O and a W, which it's really hard mm. to extend a W sound. <laughs> like, mm, all right <laughs> this is like some new information to me <laughs> i'm so glad you shared it <laughs> you mentioned phonemes earlier and a, a thought came to me that actually polish has a lot of phonemes of different sorts so i guess it's easier for for polish people to to learn different languages just because we have we are open to all these phonemes because we're, yeah. we're exposed to to them from an early age. I was going to say, because you're at kind of the confluence of several different languages. Like I was thinking geographically where Poland is, like where it would be influenced by different language systems. I was like, oh, that probably has a lot coming from like from Russian and then from Slavic languages and then like, yeah. like German language. And I'm like, oh, there's... Yeah, all of a sudden, yeah, German and French and Latin, of course. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, all these influences actually mixed here, and we are learning a lot of languages because, as I said, um, up, um, outside of Poland, like apart from all the people who moved from Poland to somewhere else and speak Polish wherever they live, like mm -hmm. we are the only country with the language, just like I know Iceland or Finland. Yeah, so we, ha we gotta learn some languages. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that it is important to learn different languages because it teaches you so much about what's important in someone else's culture and how someone else sees, and I think that that can really help you empathize with someone else. That's true. And I, I feel like I'm glad that, you know, like, for instance, you were talking about, like, how inspired your dad was by, like, U.S. and especially British rock and roll. And I'm like, oh, and, you know, like, watching cartoons. And it's like, you got to be inundated with, like, our culture and our language. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I wish that in the U.S. we got more of other people's, like, I've had to go out and, and seek it out as opposed to being exposed to it here. I'm like, mm, uh -huh. not cool. <laughs> like, it's just like... It's probably like a lot of mainstream culture, but uh, yeah, I guess the, the U.S. has this like unique opportunity of being like a melting pot of, of nationalities and languages and, you know, origins of people that like once you have to, once you decide to like seek out some, some, some cultures, you're, you're like, you're bound to, to find them. This is, this is amazing. Yeah, and definitely, uh, I would say, like, I do feel very grateful being in Los Angeles, because I would say, like, here in probably New York, and maybe, um, like, Chicago, um, maybe some of the cities in the Northwest, too, like, people do come from a lot of different places, and so if you seek it out, there are going to be people who 
who speak different languages, who eat different foods, who are going to like engage in different arts things. And I really, I really like that. (laughs) (laughs) I know that you had mentioned that you, you do volunteer work as well. And you had said like the mental health field. And I was like, oh, there's a lot of that going on right now in the U.S. I was just like, yeah, that going on your end. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I um, want to study to uh, be an experienced expert. I'm in, it's a person, someone who's been through a mental health crisis and mm-hmm. um, is trained to to help other people. And I work uh, with a foundation um, that does counseling and that attracts attention to to mental health issues and does trainings Mm -hmm. in in companies about mental health issues and uh i think like anxiety levels are really high yeah in the society right now and we're gonna have you probably you'll probably know more about it um we're gonna have i I bet we're gonna have a surge uh, on the you know, uh, psychiatrist couches and uh, so on, because people people feel this way. Yeah, I'm happy that you are helping out with companies to bring awareness to it, because that is, that's exactly what happened. Like, especially over the spring and the summer, um, I hired two associates to work with my practice because I was getting more clients than I could I could individually mm-hmm. see. And like, I've been doing all online sessions. <sighs> Um, but it was it was more than like it was just logistically more people than I could talk to. <laughs> True, but yeah, thank you so much for doing this work because, like, what what would we do without our therapists? <laughs> it would be like so much harder. I was joking because um, I saw a tweet that was like, "Therapists need therapists, and their therapists need Fiona Apple." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just like, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I love Fiona Apple. <laughs> yeah, you, you think she manages well in the pandemics? I hope so. And thinking about like advocating for companies, like I was curious, what are the views on mental health in Poland? Because I know that people have conflicting views in different countries, where they're like, oh, mm-hmm. do people seek out care. Is it something that people are aware of? Are people ashamed of it? Are they? Like, oh, hey, this is like such a vast topic, and I'm so glad you asked. I think there's still so much to do, like uh, knowledge-wise and uh, awareness-wise, because we still there is this huge stigma of of seeking pro- professional help and of feeling not not feeling well and not coping. I think uh, we had this like economical transformation going from uh, from the 1990s with this massive like success propaganda mm-hmm. that you can't can't fail, you can't show weakness. Right. And only now are we uh, learning how to you know be compassionate with with ourselves, be compassionate with one another, and that it's okay not to not to be successful and it's not all the time and it's okay not to feel great all all the time yeah Um, Yeah, because that's some pressure especially during like an economic and cultural transformation like that to feel like you have to be that and that to show weakness Mm. is wrong because i don't know yeah we had this like really we had this like really Gordon Gecko's greed is good kind of yeah. uh, capitalism and we really like haven't looked out for each other mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. enough and I hope this this is gonna change yeah I feel like I don't know it's very interesting talking about economic systems with different people because it's such it's such a strange thing that living in the U.S. where like such a developed nation that doesn't have universal health care because it's seen as something mm. that you have to earn. Like I think like that extreme sure. capitalism, I'm like, did you just forget that humans are these like kind of faulty little machines that need care? Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> True, yeah. And, and how would you expect anyone to fulfill what you expect of them if you're not taking, it's like saying that you would never do maintenance on your car because they just don't deserve it <laughs> yet. No. <laughs> yeah, or you, you have to be able to afford it. Yeah, uh, otherwise your car is only on the side of the road. Yeah. It's, it's your car's fault. It's like, it's very strange. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we need more solidarity in, in societies. and Yeah, 
then like same with mental health care like here it's starting to become more acceptable i would say and at the very least it's entered like mainstream culture and like people do i would say people joke about it um Mm -hmm. a lot more which usually i find when things enter kind of like memes and things like that that's when there starts to be change because when people are joking about something it means they're thinking about it Um, Uh uh-huh this is this is a great observation (laughs) i'll write this one down because yeah exactly um this is it and like i don't know mental health care has moved from this like something Woody Allen did in his movies right. uh, to something more universal. And <laughs> exactly. Is, I am so grateful for this. Me too. It, it also like applies to, to our local men that, you know, the stigma is even greater that you got to be this oh. big, strong man who will support the family and you can't really crack because you got to be like this strong, impeccable figure. Right. And I'm like, that sounds like awful <laughs> to have to do that all yeah time. this sounds like you know uh, an express way to suicide really that's exactly like how, how, how long can you fake yeah yeah and it's like that in fact like expressing vulnerability or that you need help or taking a pause so that you can come back stronger like that to me at least is like I don't know how to define it. Like, I, I wouldn't say like true strength because I don't think I'm like the authority necessarily on what strength is. Um, but yeah. it it seems like a more authentic form of strength to admit when you're not feeling that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think being honest is like the, the important part uh, here. And this is like especially important for, for business to understand this, that it's okay to, you know, to take a, to take a pause, to take a break. Yeah. You don't have to like give the company your 110% every day. Yeah. It's okay to do your work at 90 <laughs> or sometimes say. 75. <laughs> I've been advocating, especially during this time for all of my clients that are like, why am I not performing as well as I usually do? I'm like, oh. maybe because we're in a global pandemic? Question mark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah we we gotta we gotta let ourselves uh, you know be 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 all, be ourselves and feel these things and yeah and it's like i accommodated i you can't be like a fantastically efficient worker when you're like when you're anxious exactly. and you don't know what's gonna happen next exactly and i always tell people i'm like aim for like good enough like just get mm. to kind of like you're good enough <laughs> like did you did you try oh yeah you show up have, <laughs> like, have you have you tried to, yeah being good enough and just showing up and uh yeah this is this is it yeah I have this like so such a massive I'm such a massive perfectionist and this is how this is why I don't know I'm not very productive with, with luster because I really think that's like to for a song to to be out it has to be like absolutely polished and perfect and yeah. so on but it's something i have to fight so much yep yep yes i am sometimes fascinated by what someone's doing production wise but that's not what makes a song for me it's like do i does the song make me feel stuff like that's what i uh-huh. like it feels stuff that's um, that <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't have to be polished and perfect this is not my my kind of production i mean i started consciously listening to music by uh starting listening to the pixies and sonic youth so mm-hmm. what, what what can you say about polished production <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like they sound like they were recorded in like like a a tin alleyway and that's awesome (laughs) (laughs) yeah I was actually going to ask you that in closing like what some of your favorite phrases were in Polish that get across that same kind of image where not the exact image of (gasps) but like Uh uh, like what gets across images that like you can't in other languages because I found that so fascinating when you were saying that and I was like what are some of those I want to (laughs) know oh um of course there are sayings and uh I had to think about like a f- phrase or a saying that uh, I like in Polish and I uh, think my uh, favorite one, one of my favorite ones is Bez uh, nie ma kołaczy, which is like uh, in a free translation, <laughs> if you want to have a cake, you have to earn it. 
ah. like coaches is like special <laughs> kind of cake. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I like so, that. <laughs> so uh, because I like cakes um, and also I need to like be persistent in my work because <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise I give up too easily. I, uh, I, I tend to remember about this one. I like that sentiment, like, hey, if you want the reward, you, you got to put in the work. <laughs> you got to work it. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I was just like, oh, that's a good one to remember because I, too, am motivated by cake. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, a better motivation, right? <laughs> right, right. Oh, thank you for joining me on this journey. This was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's, it's been amazing. I love talking about language. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Why Not Both. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to like us and subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform. You can also come hang out with us on social media. We are at WNB the podcast, both on Instagram and on Twitter. This season, we are brought to you by Under the Radar magazine. Under the Radar is a nationally distributed print, music, and entertainment magazine and website. You can find them at www.undertheradarmag.com and feel free to support them on Patreon. Extra special thanks to our producer, Laura Studeris, who is literally a rock star. Thanks again, and I look forward to seeing you next episode. Bye. <laughs>